Good morning, everyone. I want to take just a minute to welcome back our RCIA people. If you are RCIA, would you raise your hand, please? Welcome. Welcome, welcome. welcome. Thanks for being with us. Um, again, to those of us who are, uh, who are regulars, uh, please see a face you don't recognize, introduce yourself. I'm really happy to be a part of your journey. And, uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions. We can be of help. Okay, so last week I began this two-part series uh, that looks at, well, we, I've titled it A Fall of Empire Rising Church. The purpose of this little mini-series, if you will, was to really set the stage for everything that comes after, uh, after this for the rest of our semester, if you will, until December. So uh, what I did last week was to take Christianity and place it in the framework, in the context of both Judaism and the, the Roman Empire. Because understanding how it is that the Catholic Church comes to be the major driving force in all of Western civilization requires us understanding that context. It requires that framework uh, of the ancient world and specifically Judaism in the ancient world to understand how that how this comes to be. And so today, what I'm going to do is to continue that theme. We're going to look at the really the, the collapse of the Western Empire and talk about um, those developments in the post-empire Christian world that lay the foundation for sort of the world we inhabit today uh, as Catholic Christians <laughs> and introduce some of the topics that we'll be covering uh, from here until until December in different um, different presenters, different formats. So, any questions from last week before I move on? Yes. You kind of touched on it. Um, uh, where does Constantine come into play in the in Constantine? Judaism and Christianity. Sure. Where does Constantine come into it? There you go. He's my first son. I did not pay for this. This was just too perfect. That's right. So, so yeah, this is actually a great place to begin because sort of where I left off was this, um, this notion that Christianity was mostly persecuted in the Roman Empire. And I alluded to the fact that... Um, that that contributes greatly to the character of Christianity, but when Christianity is no longer persecuted, how it sort of changes the character of the faith. And so this is an excellent time to, to, to talk about that, to begin actually with this. Uh, now in the year, about the year 285, the Emperor Diocletian uh, created something that's called the Tetrarchy. Uh, and I'm gonna explain what, it, if you know tetrar Tetrarchy means four, so if you understand that, what he's done is he's created four zones, four divisions, if you will, within the Roman Empire, and each one would be ruled by a tetrarch. And part of the reason for this is, and in Diocletian's mind anyway, the, the empire had grown too large. Uh, administratively, it was difficult, it was sort of an ongoing challenge to keep, to keep everything in order. So he somehow thought it would be a good idea to have four men in charge of the four different areas uh, of the Roman Empire. This might not be the best idea in history, by the way, just, just suggesting that. Because obviously the first thing that begins to develop is a rivalry among these, these various tetrarchs. So all of that sort of culminates in, um, in a series of, of civil wars between about 280, actually beginning about 293, lasting until the year 312, well, arguably, you could take it a little further than that. Um, but in the year 312, one of the tetrarchs, the tetrarch in the west, uh, Constantine, won a victory over a rival tetrarch from the east, Maxentius. Uh, he won this battle at Milvian Bridge in the year 312. And so seemingly that ends the, the civil wars, except that, um, as you're going to see, there's one more claimant that comes back a little bit later. It's kind of interesting. But for the most part, Constantine from the year 312 exercises the authority of a Caesar. 
even though he doesn't call himself that yet. He is the sole Roman emperor uh, from this point forward. And that's important because it takes this idea of tetrarchy, puts it back underneath puts it back underneath, you feel like I'm with my freshman students. <laughs> um, puts it back underneath the rule of one. And, and that's important because this unity is going to be necessary if you're going to be the primary driver of, of a particular religious belief. So Constantine uh, has essentially one rival left, and it's a man named Licinius who is um, in the east. And so what Constantine does is he arranges a marriage between his sister, Constantine's sister, a woman named Flavia Julia, arranges a marriage between her and this rival in the east, Licinius, and that marriage takes place in the year 313. So when Licinius comes to Milan, they actually meet in Milan at the imperial palace, and the wedding takes place, and from that place is where Constantine issues his famous Edict of Milan, 313, that extends toleration to Christians. Now, it does not, what it does not do is make Christianity the official religion, but it does extend toleration. Constantine had undergone, by his own account, a pretty dramatic conversion experience at the, on the eve of the Battle of, the, of Milvian Bridge in 312, where he, according to his account, he saw a, um, a vision of a cross of light in the sky, just emblazoned across the sky, and heard the voice of Christ saying, by this sign you will conquer. And so he has this, this pretty dramatic experience, <coughs> converts to Christianity. And I don't think any historian today really doubts, well, I won't say any historian. Most, the consensus is that, that Constantine's conversion was sincere, that he had a genuine a conversion. Um, it's often been cited that because Constantine was not baptized until the end of his life, that um, perhaps <coughs> this indicated he was a little bit, you know, was waffling on it. Actually, because baptism, the meaning of the sacrament of baptism was still sort of being worked out in the church in the early fourth century, it was not that uncommon for adult converts to not be baptized immediately. So, He's converted to Christianity. He invites his, his rival Licinius to Milan. Together, actually, they stand, apparently, and issue this edict uh, in 313. Their, their families are united in marriage. And this edict of Milan decreed uh, that, that Christians who had lost property, for instance, um, who had been persecuted uh, financially, that they would be compensated, that their car property would be returned to them, and actually decreed that, that all religions, all religions were tolerated, not just Christianity. So that's it's kind of an important step, though, in, in doing that. And this, the interesting thing about this, this relationship is that um, with Licinius is, I mentioned they are rivals, even though they, they united here in, in marriage. It sounds like this nice, harmonious story, doesn't it? That he's, he's conquered one tetrarch in battle, Milvian Bridge, and he's got this other one he's married to his sister. And so it's this great harmonious story. Well, don't be, don't be too, too uh, lulled into that fantasy. Because um, he had Licinius arrested and executed in 325. Um, so not, not too long before the Council of Nicaea we're going to talk about. Um, there's kind of a civil war that erupts between the men. Um, by about 318, and I think, I think most historians agree that Constantine sort of tolerated him as long as he could uh, because he was married to his sister. And then uh, he had him arrested and executed in 325. So uh, I do want to go back and say that again, though, about the Edict of Milan. It is important because it extends toleration to Christians, but it also extends toleration to everyone else. For instance, pagans. Um, Constantine was, was known for engaging pagans in dialogue and seeking input from pagans. Uh, they were even invited in to, to listen to the proceedings of the Council of Nicaea. So, so it's not just Christians this extends to, but it's still important. Uh, and it was Constantine who called the Council of Nicaea in 325 that you have no doubt, if you've been in here at all in the last couple of years, you've heard me speak about probably uh, at least a few times, 
that which, um, that, that ecumenical, we call it the first ecumenical council of the church. There are seven councils that meet while the church of West and East are still united before the 11th century. And this is the first one. Uh, Constantine calls the first council, our emperor calls a council of the church because he's concerned about the potential uh, of, the, of the faith splintering uh, due to a, a heresy known as the Arian heresy, um, a Christological heresy about whether or not Jesus was the same essence or substance as God the Father. So it is a Roman emperor, the first Christian Roman emperor, Constantine, who calls that council, who settles that issue. But what happens is that the council promotes the Nicene Creed, which we all know, right, promotes the Nicene Creed. It is affirmed at the first council of Constantinople in 381. Uh, language is added to a little bit in 381. It is essentially the creed that we recite every Sunday. Um, but what it doesn't, what the council doesn't do it, is it, it doesn't get rid of Arianism. Arianism is going to stick around for a while. Um, there are going to be sort of undercurrents of it. It's going to be kind of a constant, constant battle, really, against Arianism, which will be important in a minute, as you'll see. So, Christianity does not become the official state religion of the Roman Empire, though, until 380 with the Edict of Thessalonica. This was Emperor Theodosius I who actually makes it the official state religion essentially outlawing everything else, particularly Theodosius I wanting to outlaw uh, Arian Christianity, or he, as he called it, anti-Nicene Christianity. He wanted to rid Christianity of its heresy. Um, so he made it uh, illegal, made every other mystery cult of the ancient world illegal. So Christianity is the official religion and no others will be tolerated. Well, what a difference a century makes. A century before, Diocletian was Roman emperor. This, this will help you get some perspective. Do you remember last week I told you who holds the number two record for the number of persecutions? Diocletian. So we've come a century into the future, and Christianity is not only tolerated, thanks to Constantine, it is now the official state religion. And I hope you see why that might be important. Because by outlawing everything else, Christianity moves to the forefront. It is not only tolerated, it is promoted by the imperial government to everyone. Pagans are encouraged to convert because they suffer financial losses and penalties if they don't. And by this time, by the turn of the, we are now at the end of the fourth turn of the fifth century, um, the Roman Empire in the West is not going to last much longer, right? So as the empire is beginning to collapse, the church is actually rising. Uh, and in many ways, you'll see, we'll take, we'll take the place of that. Uh, Theodosius I, I just want to mention this about him. This is a really interesting guy. Um, strong personality, by all accounts, very strong personality. Vigorous defender of Nicene Christianity. Uh, but even he got himself into trouble with the church because of another strong personality. How many of you have heard me talk about St. Ambrose? Um, St. Ambrose of Milan, he's one of the original four Latin doctors of the church. Um, Saint, it was St. Ambrose who baptized St. Augustine, for instance, who brought him into the faith. Um, St. Ambrose learned that Theodosius I had ordered a massacre in Thessalonica uh, there, was a, there was a revolt. Okay, just sort of give you some background. Because of the, the resources of the empire were being stretched so much that the army really couldn't defend the frontiers, uh, he was, and, couldn't, and he couldn't draft enough people to serve in the army, he began uh, bringing in Goths to the army, drafting barbarians into the army. And the people of Thessalonica um, found out that there were Goths who were, who were stationed at their garrison, and they revolted. Not against the emperor, but against this idea that these barbarian peoples could be literally right there charged with defending them. So they revolted, and Theodosius put down this revolt, but then he, he actually put down the revolt, but then he engaged in a massacre of hundreds and hundreds of people, probably many innocent people, um, 
And so uh, Ambrose, St. Ambrose, excommunicated. Excommunicated the Roman emperor. Okay? Now that takes some guts. <laughs> And, and this is depicted in a lot of artwork of the, of the, uh, of the early Middle Ages, and particularly in the High Renaissance. Uh, artists like to depict this, uh, of St. Ambrose standing in the door of the church in Milan and refusing to allow the emperor to enter. You know, and, um, and so, at any rate, Theodosius does repent and he's welcomed back into the faith. It is St. Ambrose who lifts the order of excommunication. Uh, but, but just to give you an idea about um, sort of the church and the empire at the same time exercising this strong authority, each seeing itself kind of as a defender of the same. The, the empire by this time sees itself as a defender of the faith, and obviously the church sees that as its primary purview. So it's going to lead to some interesting conflict a little, a little later on. So, again, the Roman Empire nurtures the faith, it established the framework for the success of the spread of the gospel. Mm -hmm. By the end of the empire, the emperors themselves are promoting it, guaranteeing that it is the Catholic faith that's going to be the foundation of the Western world. When it is handed on in the collapse of empire, it is the Catholic Church that will be the foundation, the only thing that remains uh, when the empire falls to those barbarians, as it does. There you go. Have you ever seen a more confusing map? <laughs> I've actually tried to find the most convoluted one that I could because I think it sends the right message that this was not a fluid event. This was not a, um, oh, the empire collapsed in this year because of this specific movement. This is actually, this is a map that shows the movement of what we call the barbarians. The Romans would call them the outside people those people who were beyond the frontiers of the Roman Empire who could not, well, at least as far as Rome was concerned, were not really fit for the idea of Roman civilization. But this is a map that shows the movement of these, of these various tribes really beginning, um, and actually there's a couple I think that are missing from here. Well, I don't have the eastern ones. So this is the movement of the western tribes, uh, except the Huns. Um, Really, the, the pressure on the empire in both East and West begins about the year 180, begins pretty early. Um, now, I want you to think about, about the empire. The furthest reaches of it would be along um, at, past Central Europe, kind of like in, the, in the, what we would call perhaps the Baltic uh, region today. Um, a capital at Constantinople, obviously, you see the, the, um, the Eastern Empire there. But um, beginning about 180, you have uh, incursions coming from the east of people called the Parthians who are, who are putting pressure on Constantinople, or that region. Not Constantinople doesn't exist yet. And then there's a group in the west called the Goths. Um, and this is why, exactly why, the Goths acquired this really nasty reputation. The reason the people of Thessalonica, for instance, revolted is because they knew the reputation of these people. They've been around a couple of hundred years in, in terms of harassing Rome. So that begins really in earnest in 180. Um, by about the year 410, we have the, the, the first severe um, encroachment on the northern frontier, which is along, um, really kind of along this line, beginning, well, really beginning about right here. The first encroachment. Um, that's severe, about the year 410. Severe enough that 410 is the year, for instance, that Rome called all of the legions out of Britannia. All the legions came from Britannia. All of the legions were called out of what is, was called Gaul. And then, of course, by the year 476, all the legions have been called to Rome, and they can't even defend the city. It's by 476, the, the whole idea of empire in the West is gone. <clears throat> So anyone paying attention between the year, particularly between the year 410 and 476, anybody paying attention knew that the empire was collapsing, knew that it was going away. And I want to go back and touch on something that I mentioned last week, um, which is the whole idea of empire. 
If you think about it philosophically, as at least one person in our Christian tradition did, if you think about it in terms of a philosophy, well, what does it really mean if an empire falls anyway? You know, what does it matter? Um, we're talking about, however, an entity that is without rival, really, in history in terms of of empire. I mean, obviously, the British Empire of the 19th century is going to be larger geographically, but in terms of influence uh, in culture in the West, there there's no there's no parallel to what Rome does. But of course, the idea of empire is is a human construct. It is an earthly thing, isn't it? So you remember that, um, and I'm, I'm circling back to last week to make this point, that remember St. Augustine of Hippo, who's living right as the empire is beginning its collapse. And he died in 430, so, so he's witnessing uh, some of this collapse. He didn't live to see the city of Rome fall, but he knew that it was happening. He knew, he knew what was going on. And uh, St. Augustine is, of course, Bishop of North Africa, um, a convert to Christianity. I mentioned St. Ambrose is actually the one who baptized him. And obviously, probably the towering intellect for us for the first thousand years of the faith. He is, he's the most significant intellectual figure outside of St. Paul, I guess. But St. Augustine, remember last week I told you that, that there were three ways in which the Roman Empire nurtured Christianity? Politically, socially, and intellectually. Do you remember this? This is a test. Remember that intellectually, and and that the the intellectual influence that that Rome preserved was actually Greek philosophy. Do you remember that? So Saint Augustine wrote his famous City of God in response to the criticism that was coming from pagans about the collapse of the Roman Empire. That, look, we were just fine until, look what Theodosius did. He made the entire empire Christian, and now we're collapsing. And, and really blaming the fall of man's empire on faith. And so it is from St. Augustine that we learn something very important. When he takes this Platonic philosophy and infuses it into his explanation in the city of God, we learn that empires are ordained at the will of God at the providence of God. Empire serves some earthly purpose for man, right? And empires rise and empires fall, again, at God's will because of nothing that man does. And, and Augustine even goes as far as to say, look, it matters not that the Roman Empire is collapsing. It matters not because the only city that matters is the eternal city of God. Okay. So that's kind of a review from last week. We talked about that last week, that he, he makes this important explanation. But it's also in this work, The City of God, where he draws upon Plato in another way, but in a very specific way. Did anybody ever have to read Plato's Republic? Okay, I'll have new homework. <laughs> Plato's Republic. That was so long ago, though. <laughs> um, okay. Anybody ever seen the Matrix movies? Yeah. yeah. You seen the Matrix? Okay, get more hands on that. Well, the Matrix is actually a um, a movie about an allegory that he tells within the Republic. The allegory of the cave. Oh, I didn't read that. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, I digress. Yeah, but I but um, I'm, I'm searching for a way to reach you here with this. Yeah. Plato's yeah. Republic. Um, <laughs> is where, where Plato, the, the philosopher, describes the ideal society. The Republic is, is, is an ideal. It's not meant to be something that could be really instituted. He sees it as an ideal. And, um, and so what he does is he talks about, in Plato's Republic, he talks about how society should be structured. And he sees everything as being highly ordered. So, for instance, at the top, society should be ruled by a philosopher king. <laughs> Right? Now, why a philosopher king? Well, it should be somebody who is wise, somebody who is educated, <clears throat> somebody who is enlightened in a way that maybe the masses are not. But this person would, would obviously sort of rise to the top. And, and Plato <coughs> stresses that this person would not be chosen by man. It's something that would naturally occur. Okay? 
um, this philosopher king would emerge. And then underneath the philosopher king, you have kind of what I like to call mid-level management in the Republic, which is, the, he calls it the College of Philosophers. These are men who support the philosopher king in some way. Y'all see where this is going? Who support the philosopher king in some way, who have some authority of some kind, um, but they primarily work to promote the, the vision and mission of, of the philosopher king. And so this college of philosophers also has to be people who are capable of holding authority and leadership. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so you're thinking, well, what does that have to do with Christianity? Everything. Yeah. Right? Because what Augustine does is he takes Plato's model in the Republic and he applies it to the church. It forms the foundation not just for the, for the medieval church but into the current age. And it also is going to serve as the foundation for, for Western society. This idea of hierarchy. Hierarchy. Um, and as I said, for Plato, the ideal city is like well, he uses this expression. It's like the cosmos itself, the cosmos being the perfectly ordered creation. The ideal city is like this, and he says the closest thing we can get to it with men is to make this kind of hierarchy. Um, so, Augustine takes this idea and translates it into the city of God to the Christian church as an ordered hierarchy. The philosopher king is who? Pope. The Pope. The College of Philosophers is who? The Cardinal. Right. Well, first the bishops. At the time of Augustine, we don't have cardinals yet, so it's, it's bishops. Um, and later, we add some layers of hierarchy to that. But is this hugely significant infusing this ancient idea of order into the church? As the empire collapses, just as the empire is collapsing, we see this towering figure like Augustine come forward with a model for preserving the order. Do you see? Preserving the order. It's not just going to be the church, but all of medieval society. For St. Augustine, and especially later for St. Thomas Aquinas in the High Middle Ages, the idea of divine right is introduced for the first time. Because where Plato says that the philosopher king is not chosen by man, right? What does St. Augustine say about the philosopher king of the Pope? How is he chosen, do you suppose? By the will of God. An anointing of God. And so that gets translated into medieval society with the idea of kingship. That kings will be chosen by the will of God divine right, as we call it. Man does not choose himself to rule, but God does. Um, introducing the idea that becomes foundational in the West, if you took away nothing else today, all power is divine to the medieval mind. All power has a divine source. It originates one place, and it comes to men at the will of God only. Um, man does not hold power by himself. So that's, that's a very important idea. So what the Middle Ages sees in the wake of Rome is the rise of this divine right of kings, the idea of divine right in the church. So we have the rise of two institutions at the same time. What are they? The papacy and monarchy at the exact same time. Exact same time, church and state. Very good. Okay, so... Um, Talking about how sort of the church steps into the breach, if you will, uh, the church takes the lead into ordering society. It steps, it's the first to step into that void uh, left by the collapse of, of Roman imperial authority. Here's how. One of the ways that the church had already extended uh, influence into society directly was through the rise of monasticism. Um, the, the monastic orders that established themselves throughout Europe, even in, during the time of the late empire, this is going on, every village in Europe, at the center of every village, major village in Europe, most likely there was a monastic community, or there wasn't one far away. And so this center of life really um, becomes the new focus point, the, the new focal point for community. Is, is around this community. Um, the monastic communities are responsible for furthering the teachings 
of the gospel, right? Because what do, what do monasteries primarily focus on is their missions. The gospel imperatives mm -hmm. of feeding the poor, right? Taking care of the sick, taking in the widow, caring for the orphans. Um, that, is, that is the focus. It's the rhythm of medieval life centers around this example of people living the gospel. Now, I am not going to stand here and suggest to you that monasteries don't become corrupt and worldly, because they certainly do, okay? We can't deny that. The, the, the church is, is in a broken world, and so there is that. But, but overwhelmingly, if you read enough social histories of the Middle Ages, <coughs> what you begin to see is the church at the local level, the lowest level, the level of the village, is really living the message of the gospel. Uh, it's quite encouraging because it's easy to get discouraged if you read about this pope doing this and this emperor doing this to this pope and and you know the scandalous lives of many of the highest ranking prelates of the church. That would be very easy to get discouraged. I would encourage you to look at what the church is doing on a local level. Uh, it's it's pretty remarkable. So you, again, you have this this example. Of the church living out the gospel in a visible way among people, among people who then take in that message, they process that message. This is being done institutionally, by the way, right? Hospitals, soup kitchens, orphanages. This is being done institutionally in a way that sticks. It sticks in the Western mind. Do you know that the Greco Roman world has no parallel for this? Do you know this? The concept of charity is really unknown in the, in the Greco-Roman world, at least in an organized kind of institutional, morally responsible kind of way. Christianity is responsible for introducing this to the West. The idea that we take care of each other. It is the Christian message, and it sticks. It's the foundation, really, for everything that comes next. Then we have also going on, sort of in, in secular sense, you've got the rise of feudalism, which is hugely important to cementing Christianity. Um, this, this social organizational kind of framework um, in which the church is centered, the church finds itself. The rise of kingship creates the same kind of hierarchy, right? So if you look at, at medieval society in the secular sense, what you see is kind of like a pyramid. The king is at the top. And then underneath, you have layers of society that are all in relationship with one another. I think this is something we miss about feudalism, is, is that society is in relationship. You are either in, you are in some way in relationship with whoever is above you in that pyramid, and you are yet responsible for those who are below you. So, for instance, where does the church fit into this? Well, there's the king at the top, and then the next layer, I would say, is the nobility. But among the nobility, you find the princes of the church, as we start calling them, the bishops of the church, who are also nobles in a sense. You have secular and spiritual lords, if you will. And then below that, you know, you have the 99%, which are the peasants, right, who are working. But at every single layer in this hierarchy, there is purpose. There's purpose that is largely directed by the church. It is a, a major churchman of the 11th century, excuse me, 12th century. Some of you may have heard of, um, um, anybody ever heard of Peter Abelard? Anybody ever heard of him? Some of you might have heard of him. So I've got, I've got some nodding heads back there. Um, he's the one who says that, that um, the nobles are to fight when necessary to protect the realm, the order, the church is to pray, and the peasants are to work. Everybody has a purpose, and it all serves order. So, um, as St. Augustine told us in the City of God, you have this um, serving of God's plan that's lived out in a really tangible way. So, this newly constituted empire, as, as medieval society begins to grow, you're going to have this newly constituted empire by the year 800. And he is a Christian king, Christian emperor, who, um, who had managed to uh, consolidate and combine a lot of territory uh, by the year 800. 
and he nurtures, again, creates just the right framework for Christianity now in its eighth century to continue to flourish, to be the foundation. And I'm talking about this guy right here, right, who's depicted in this artwork. <coughs> um, Charles the Great, Carolus Magnus, Charlemagne, who was a Frankish king. I'm gonna go back and show you something on this map. You see these people right here? Okay, so I think it's kind of a general rule that in the wake of the collapse of the Western Empire, all of those very disparate um, um, barbarian groups, um, if you think about, well, let's not use the Huns as an example for anything, but the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, a certainly established kingdoms in the wake of the collapse of the empire. You have Ostrogothic kingdoms, for instance, in Italy. You have a Visigothic kingdom on the Iberian Peninsula. But, and the Lombards, who were always the bullies, but anyway, um, we could do a whole class on just these people. But these people are the only ones who are really able to do something kind of remarkable. Build something that is greater than just local influence. Like the Ostrogoths built a little kingdom, but they never managed to build anything bigger than local. The Visigoths never really get big. Does this make sense? They can't maintain a structure that is, that is higher than just the local level. And I have, a, I have a theory about this, and you can take it for what it's worth, which might not be worth anything. But I do think that because many of the Frankish kings, the early Frankish kings were already Christians. They had already been exposed to this concept of order and how society should be structured, right? That it's not a surprise to me that they become the ones who were able to expand their influence so that by the time of Charlemagne, his empire is like this. It looks like a rebirth of the Roman Empire in the West. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, the, these petty kingdoms sort of pass away uh, and Charlemagne is able to, to, to consolidate. Uh, this painting actually shows, um, um, not this painting, yeah. that painting actually shows Charlemagne's coronation. He forged a very strong relationship with the papacy, pledged to defend the Pope. And so on, the day, uh, on Christmas Day of the year 800, this very famous event takes place where he went to Mass in Rome and Pope Leo III, at the end of Mass, placed a golden crown on Charlemagne's head and called him the Emperor of the Romans, seeming to signify kind of this rebirth of the Roman Empire, making him a Christian emperor uh, and this, of course, this whole deal um, of 800 is seriously debated by historians, and you can imagine why. What does it mean? Who does Charlemagne owe his power to? He's elected by all kind of people. So, so we've introduced the controversy of is the church the oh. conduit of all divine power? Does all divine power flow through the church to secular kings? Or do secular kings have power in their own right? We've introduced kind of a rivalry between church and state. It's going to play out in some pretty dramatic ways. But the whole concept here is still going back to that order, that order of society that is, that is Roman. Um, so, so the coronation of Charlemagne, you know, you can debate it all you want, but it, it certainly sets in motion um, the idea that somehow all that divine power we talked about flows through the church first. Um, I'd love to know what Charlemagne thought about this. History does not record his reaction. History doesn't record if he even knew it was going to happen. I mean, what do you do? Say no? That's what Napoleon did. Right? Y'all know that story? That when the, the Pope went to crown Napoleon Emperor, Napoleon reached out and took the crown away from him and placed it on his own head. <laughs> he was a student of history, by the way. <clears throat> so, there's also something going on <coughs> in medieval society um, that, again, I think sometimes we overlook or we, or we overly romanticize and don't think too much about its importance. But everybody's heard of chivalry or the code of chivalry. 
uh, that begins to develop about the, about the time of Charlemagne, really about 800, 900, um, leading into the High Middle Ages, you have this very interesting social responsibility that codifies itself. It codifies itself. And it, it, it actually corresponds with the rise of a very specific class of people. By the ninth century, you have a very specific class of people um, from the Saxon word for young man, which is, anybody know? The knight. The knight. The knight, right. Knighthood. Knight is a Saxon word that means young man. So you have this rise of this class of people that I don't know, but has, it seemingly, it corresponds with the invention of the stirrup. Now, there's a lot of, of textbooks that always seem to make, make, make a thing out of this, like knights come about because they invented the stirrup. I'm not sure that that has anything to do with it. I suspect it's the other way around. But, um, but anyway, this, this interesting group of young men who are not nobles, they're not nobles, they're not landed aristocracy, they are also not peasants. They are talented young men who are identified by nobility to sort of rise above their station, right? And be a layer of sort of social protection um, that the noble could call upon. But also, and remember, think about, about this ordering I've mentioned. What is built into the code of chivalry is the Christian responsibility to everyone. So the knight takes an oath to defend his king and to defend his lord, right? Of course, those above him. But what else must the knight do? He has to pledge to defend the people below him, the innocence of society, <clears throat> specifically women and children and clergy, women and children in the, in the church. He will defend with his life if necessary by this code of chivalry. And, and again, I think we sometimes overlook this as being an important part of this, of this Christian ordering of society. Uh, it is from this rich medieval reality that we get the imagery of knights um, rescuing damsels from towers, right? <laughs> we get those great stories of damsels being rescued from towers, of knights slaying dragons. Um, this whole social order was constructed to model society along Christian lines. And incidentally, what does the dragon represent? Devil. It represents evil. That's right. That's right. Again, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ being lived out in the very social order of the Middle Ages itself, bringing order out of chaos. So out of order comes peace and stability. Going back to what we looked at the Roman Empire, right? Out of order comes peace and stability, and peace and stability nurtures the Christian life. We thrive in that order and stability. Okay, so because of the, um, the inevitable rivalry that happens between uh, secular and spiritual authority, which I'm not going to talk too much about except to say that there, there are some really dramatic examples of this in the Middle Ages. But you see the church becoming ever more assertive, and this is certainly true by the high Middle Ages, becoming ever more assertive in directing behavior in society, uh, taking a lead, really, in issuing decrees that are meant to, to order society. Everything from decreeing when men can wage war, which is um, something called the truce of God, when men can wage war, when society can engage in war, what are the seasons that you can, when are you forbidden to fight? And it gives this whole theological uh, construct or explanation for why it is that man can't wage war during Lent, for instance. He can't wage war uh, during Advent or, or during, uh, on holy days, uh, major holy days, you can't wage war. Well, this is a way, again, that the church is ordering society along theological lines, taking the secular and making it have meaning in an order. Uh, they do the same thing with another decree called um, the, 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 uh, the, the peace of God, where 
this really sort of reinforces the code of chivalry, that anyone who harms a clergy, uh, a woman, uh, a child, is automatically excommunicated, right? cut off from the faith. You can't conform to the order. Is this sounding familiar? You can't conform to the order, then you're outside the church. Um, the, this comes again from the highest level of the church. The popes of the high middle ages are some of the most powerful personalities in history, and they're the ones who intervene directly and forcefully into secular affairs and have no problems doing it at all. None. That's a, that's a subject for a whole other class, though. Okay, so from this position at the very base and present at every level, at every level of society, fully infused, stepping out of the Roman Empire into that void and providing the foundation and the order, this is how the, the Catholic Church gives to us our great Western tradition. Because they are now able to forge for us, at every level of society, the drivers. How, how, we, how we do civilization in the West. How this force came to shape our world in virtually every aspect is a fantastic story. And it's one that we're going to see sort of played out over the next few months. Um, beginning in the framework of empires we explored last week, uh, moving forward right into the, all the way into modern times um, by, the, by the end of, of the semester, if you will. Obviously, the church played the single most important role in defining the family in defining the family and provided a moral framework for society because the family is the first unit of society and marriage is defined as a sacrament by the church. And let me, let me explain, this is not something that developed immediately. This is a sacrament, it was sacramental in nature, perhaps always, perhaps we can demonstrate that always throughout the first centuries of the church. But it's formalized really by the, by the 12th century in a way that makes it a true sacrament and, and is seen as, um, as a mirror of Christ's union with the church. This is a mirror of that order that you see in individuals, um, that marriage would be that, giving very sound theology to human love and procreation. Right, gives us that, that mirror of Jesus and the church. Our Western ideas of law and justice also are predicated directly on the values promoted by the church um, across the centuries, even in the brutal times of the Middle Ages. Okay, because Again, I think it's easy to lose this perspective when you think about how brutal the age was. Um, that even in those times, for instance, it was the church that was often the guarantor of rights for someone. For someone who was accused, it was often the church that stepped in to guarantee those rights for that individual. To, to shape local law, for instance, local response to a situation. The church often intervened. Think of the medieval notion of sanctuary, for instance. And I don't think we have to think any further than this to get the point that the church provided a haven for people seeking justice. If you could make it to the church, and you could make it, and you could, you, uh, this has been misunderstood. Sanctuary doesn't work like you just run into the church and claim sanctuary. It doesn't work that way. But if you made it to the church and you made it to the altar, then you could claim sanctuary. And it does not, it does not um, provide you, like, um, protection forever. You can't stay there forever, right? But what it does is it interrupts a process that might be unjust. Do you see? Do you see? And this is at the church's initiative that this happens, that, that this becomes the norm. It interrupts a process that could potentially be unjust, potentially, potentially be unlawful or unfair. And so the church provides the individual the opportunity to claim sanctuary until such time as it can be worked out. Now, it's not as it's often portrayed in movies like 
you know, the bad guy runs into the church and says, no, 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 you can't touch me. <laughs> it's not like that. Um, but it does provide a check, if you will, uh, to make sure that that person is, in fact, being treated according to the law and according to his inherent human dignity and rights. So it really is um, an interesting thing. Obviously, literacy flourishes in the church. Um, the church was and still is, I think, in many ways, the keeper of the record of humanity. Uh, they keep the record. Uh, I've mentioned in here before that there is no page of human history that you can turn that the church is not there that the church is not there, at least in the last 2,000 years, right? You cannot turn a single page of history and not see it, and they keep the record of it. The church, arguably, and I will defend this, I say is, is always pro-intellectual, contrary to what sometimes popular sentiment might be. The first universities of Europe were established by who? The church. It was the church. The church that encouraged the free exchange of ideas, right? Now, if you're going to be discussing heresy, you better get a license to do it, right? But, but it is the church that is the, that is the driving intellectual force throughout, uh, well, into, into our current age, I would, I would argue. The notion that intellect and human reason is a gift from God and a part of our human nature is part of our Catholic teaching. We were gifted with memory, reason, and skill, right? And why? So that we could know God. Our intellect is a gift from God, and we are encouraged to use it. Um, the, this is a theme I'm going to address much more uh, fully in a few weeks. It's something that I've called, there's no such thing as the dark ages, is to talk about the church as this light of learning, this light that, that carried the record forward. Um, the survival of the Latin language itself, I mean, think about this. The survival of the Latin language itself is because of the church, directly because of the church. Because Latin would have died when all of those languages, the Romance languages, developed in isolation from one another after the collapse of the empire. We would have no Latin language today. Uh, it's, it is foundational to the notion of Renaissance, by the way, right? Some of the most beautiful artistic uh, legacy that we have in the West of the high Renaissance would have happened with, had there not been this this tug to go back to this idea of, of classical uh, learning that the church kept burning, the kept the church kept alive. So think about the remarkable gift that we have in both art and architecture that was driven by the church. And this is something that that we're going to talk about. Uh, Father Dwayne and I are actually doing in December, splitting this up. He's going to be looking at part of it, and I'll be doing the other. Uh, to look at art and architecture and the church's influence and the incredible gift that the church gave to us. The, the church is a patron of the arts. That cannot be disputed. And think about if you wanted to, to show anybody in the world something visual that speaks to the greatest architectural feats ever accomplished by man, what would you show them? The cathedrals. The cathedrals of the Middle Ages. Right. The greatest architectural feats that we have in our history as human beings. Well, it might be outside of the pyramids, okay. But, um, but certainly if you wanted to show someone um, that, that have that kind of gravitas about the importance of what the church does aesthetically for us is that. Certainly the same is true for the church's role in advancing music, um, sacred music as an art form, something that actually Aaron Wilson is going to be here talking about to you on November the 10th. Uh, I'll give you a little, a little preview or a hint is that it is uh, among monasteries, monastic communities for instance, that, um, that first the first forms of kind of our modern ideas of Western music, uh, musical notation certainly, uh, came about in order to standardize the liturgy. That's because of the church that that happens. Um, and I thought about this. I'm not sure that we can argue that all music derives from this. I guess it depends on how you define music. But, but certainly the idea of musical notation is something that's a great gift, a great gift from the church to, to Western civilization. And then, of course, there is science. 
the role of the church in leading in the sciences, uh, again, is something I think that, that there's a popular kind of misunderstanding about in the world, but we Catholics know it, don't we? We know it, that the church is not anti-intellectual, the church is not anti-science. Um, the church's role here, I, I think, is sometimes misunderstood because um, really, I, I think there's, more than anything, there's one instance in history that gives us this reputation. Anybody want to guess what it was? Galileo. Everybody says it. It's always that. The trial of Galileo. That's the thing that, that really sort of paints us, I think, in a very broad brush as being anti-science. So one of the reasons that I love, um, I love teaching that particular period of the scientific revolution to college students is to be able to make this point that if you really study what was at stake during the trial of Galileo, and you really study the church's response to that, is it anti-science? The same Pope, Urban VIII, did I just drop something? The same Pope, Urban VIII, who is um, the one who, for instance, placed Galileo under house arrest, is the same Pope that was really encouraging uh, astronomical study. It isn't, I will tell you this, it isn't that the church believed that the earth was not the center of the universe. That was not Galileo's crime, right? Galileo's crime was not in saying that the, that the earth revolves around the sun. I think I misstated that a minute ago. The sun is the center of the universe. I do, of the solar system, I do know that, by the way. <laughs> I learned that in like second grade. Um, the church never said that Galileo was wrong. What did the church say to Galileo? Well, he was ordered to stop publishing, but let's talk about why. Now, I do think that this is an important point to stop and make. The church is the sole interpreter of Holy Scripture. And when science enters into the realm of creation and starts exploring the way that creation is ordered, that falls within the purview of the church. And this is certainly true in the time that Galileo lived. He would have known this, that it's, it's the church's objection to his teaching and interpretation of Holy Scripture, not the fact that he was saying that the, the earth revolved around the sun. Okay, Pope Urban VIII knew this, by the way, that the earth revolved around the sun. So the reason this is so important is to, to sort of unpaint the church as being anti-science and more a defender of its right to interpret scripture. That's its purview, is to interpret scripture. So Galileo was warned, could you just kind of scroll it back a little bit? And what did Galileo do when he was warned? He published a book um, called The Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems, where he pits a, two fictional characters against each other, arguing these two world systems, one being um, geocentrism, that the Earth is the center of the universe, the other heliocentrism, it's the sun that's the center. And who is the person arguing for geocentrism? He's a figure that Galileo names Simplicio, <laughs> who looks and sounds remarkably like Pope Urban VIII. That was his response to being reminded that it was the church's role to interpret Holy Scripture. Okay? So this is when Galileo gets called in. He's ordered to recant. He is summoned before the Inquisition. He's ordered to recant, and ultimately he does. He does because he was a man of faith. He was a man who was obedient, and he did. He ultimately recanted. So the end of that story, of course, is, is that in 1992, uh, Pope St. John Paul II reopened Galileo's case and, and apologized. Um, but I think that, that because of the time we're talking about, we're 100 years out from the Protestant movement at the time of Galileo's trial, this one event in church history was seized upon as an opportunity to paint the church as anti-science as anti-progressive, okay? Which seems to me a little bit unfair when you look at the entirety 
of the church's response to science. There are more scientists, mathematicians, explorers who were Catholics than any other, particularly among Jesuits. This is a major contribution of the Jesuits was in the realm of science and medicine. Uh, exploring, I mean, the, several of the world's major rivers are, are named by Jesuit explorers. So, I mean, it, it's not this, this anti-science perspective, I think, is, is quite unfair. But my point is that in every page of history, the church has shaped our story. The way we calculate time, I mentioned this, this briefly at the beginning, um, the Gregorian calendar, the way we calculate time in the West is the Catholic Church bringing order out of chaos, ordering our time. Uh, major treaties forged between warring nations, the church was either the primary driver of, was present for the negotiations of, or was behind the scenes to assist if needed. Every major war you can think of in history for 2,000 years, the church has been there as a peacemaker. Sometimes on a warring side, by the way. Mm -hmm. And at least one pope that led an army into battle. Sure. Um, but throughout the pages of history, that is true. A role in moral theology that is lived out in the world, whether it was in denouncing slavery, whether it was in denouncing the idea of unjust war and explaining what just war is, whether it was the mistreatment of women <coughs> and children, even standing before the United Nations to speak on the issue of human rights and human dignity, issues of social justice, right? Even in times when the church seemingly wasn't loud enough, and we can be critical of that, for instance, fascism. Um, history bears out the role of the church in shaping outcomes for Western civilization, in shaping outcomes for our society. The church has been the loudest voice for social justice in human history. As a matter of fact, that's something that Ryan Smith is going to be talking about in November is looking at the church and social justice teachings. The church continues to take a very public, uh, very public and vocal uh, theological position on issues uh, such as immigration, health care, the welfare of the poor, uh, to warnings about things like embryonic stem cell research. Uh, the church has a very vocal position, some of which might be hot button issues for some of us. The church has never been silent on such things, and why? You know, I, I know people who say they wish the church would stay out of politics. I was like, why do you say that as a Catholic? Look at our history. Look at our tradition of being the voice of social justice, the primary mover of the idea of that in our entire civilization is the Catholic church living out the gospel of Jesus Christ in an ordered way and directing all of that is 2,000 years of history of that. So, you know, if it makes you uncomfortable, I would just tell you to remember that our moral theology is lived out in the world. You can't separate politics. The idea of politics, you can't separate from moral theology. It is lived out in the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our message. It is our message. Framed in man's empires, right? But ultimately in the city of God. So, I think I'm going to shut up. What time is it? Did I talk an hour? Yeah. Isn't that amazing how I do that? <laughs> it's just like I have this internal timer. I know when to shut it down. All right, class, you're dismissed. No. Um, questions? Yes. In the time of the fall of the Roman Empire and the start of Christianity, was there any thought of moving Christianity from Rome? Or, uh, okay. So, so the question is about in the, in the fall of the Roman Empire, was there any, any thought given to moving Christianity from Rome? Is that it? Or, 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 or. Okay. So um, in the fourth century, and one of the things I did not talk about this week, but I mentioned briefly in passing last week, is that in the fourth century, uh, Constantine, one of the things he did was create a second center, second uh, capital for the Roman Empire at Constantinople. The old Greek city of Byzantium became Constantinople. And what it does is it creates um, really not just two capitals for the empire. It has the unfortunate effect of creating two ultimately rival centers of Christianity. So that in the, in the West, at Rome, for instance, you have a tradition 
um, that is primarily centered around the Latin language, um, that is uh, in Western traditions. Um, the Eastern Church is, um, is more susceptible to the influence of the rise of Islam, for instance, by the, by the, by the sixth, seventh century. And so you see the Eastern Church begin to respond in ways that the Western Church finds offensive um, by destroying icons, for instance, and images and things like that. Um, so you've got these kind of rival centers of Christianity. One church, we are one church until the middle of the 11th century when there's a very, very tragic split between us that is not healed to this day. I mean, it's ultimately it's healed somewhere else already, but it's not healed. Here, Eastern and Western Christians are divided, sadly. Yeah, but there is there is a there is a second center of Christianity, if you will, in Constantinople. And y'all, that could that would have to be like a whole. Other. There's so much there, so much there. Anything else? Well, here we go again, baffled or dazzled. Yes, <laughs> yes. You have a question? We have Go ahead. Your map didn't show the barbarians going yeah. into the Constantinople. Is that just because your map didn't show it? Or was no, this is, this is actually, Constantinople um, lives on until 1453. Constantinople is not, the walls of the city are not breached until 1453 by the Ottoman Turks. It's not the barbarians that bring down Constantinople. But did they not try? They, the, there are the Parthians. The Parthians are, are in um, eastern parts of what would become the Eastern Empire um, by about the end of the second century, one eighty or so. I didn't know if they were just set up differently that they didn't really move that way. No, actually, these bar these movement of these barbarian tribes were all sort of directed at the Western Roman Empire, with the exception of that early incursion, the Parthians in the second century. You had a question. What is next week's lecture? Next week, next week, um, Father Dwayne and I will be um, in the cathedral. We are actually, the, the whole cathedral community is meeting together, as I understand it. Uh, it is Respect Life Sunday, and Father Dwayne will be reciting the rosary. I'm going to do a brief little introduction by talking about the gift of the rosary to St. Dominic. Is that correct, Father Dwayne? That's correct. That is correct? Okay. And have one other question? Yeah, um, it was last class. Yes, because because Rome pursued. Yes, Rome pursued a policy in Palestine that they didn't do anywhere else. They permitted the Jews freedom of worship. They gave them a temple, a king, and a ruling council of the Jews, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. They did something very unusual, which was God's providence for us, for sure. Anything else, Father oh, Dwayne? You have something you want to say? Please remember to bring your rosary next week. We'll be, as Dr. Cheryl said, we'll be reciting the rosary for Pro-Life Month. So bring your rosary. Yeah. All right. Okay. Dottie has something. Uh, next week, expect family Sunday. And if you know any of our parishioners that are pregnant, their families, please ask them to call the church because we will do special blessings for them and also we have some gifts. So if you know of any families that are pregnant, Please have a call. All right. See y'all next week. <laughs>